hub, and spoke. Audio Collective. This episode is brought to you by The Food Issue from Commercial Type, a one-off online magazine as type specimen designed to show our extensive range of text faces. We were bored with the typical lazy dogs and grumpy wizards, so we commissioned six original pieces of writing centered around the theme of eating. You can experiment with how different combinations of typefaces change the overall feeling of the text as you read, and even get into the weeds with granular changes to point size and letting. Read it at foodissue.commercialtype.com. Without great art directors, illustration really can't thrive. The ones who are the most open-minded and interested are the ones that, in my view, offer the most creative freedom. I think they're the best. And I am so endlessly lucky that I've gotten to work with these incredible people. This is Print is Dead, Long Live Print, a podcast about magazines and the people who made and make them. I'm Deborah Bishop. I'm Patrick Mitchell. I'm Ann Keto. By any measure, Anita Coons has built a dream career. She's won every award, been inducted into every Hall of Fame, won every medal and national distinction. When her native Canada ran out of honors to bestow, the country minted a postage stamp in her honor. Over the last 40 years, the Toronto-based illustrator has created covers for The New Yorker, Rolling Stone, Time Magazine, and many, many others. On top of that, she's now authored two volumes of her own work. She is, as Gail Anderson, her former Rolling Stone collaborator puts it, a freaking national treasure. And yet, despite all that success, Coons confesses to still battling with self-doubt. No matter how great the genius or how many accolades hang on the wall, the familiar feeling of insecurity and inadequacy spares no one, it seems. Is this good enough? Am I good enough? Every thinking creative person faces these questions at some point in their career. While the universality of self-doubt may serve as consolation for those wrestling with some type of creative crisis, today's guest has a different attitude about it. Instead of trying to quash self-doubt, embrace it, she says. Self-doubt is fuel, a generative force. Allowing a measure of uncertainty fosters experimentation, playfulness, and an open-mindedness that helps keep the ego in check. And in a profession like editorial illustration, where rejection is ever-present, self-doubt can transform into a survival skill. In this episode, we delve into all of this, and we'll talk about Kuhn's recent turn as an author, her favorite art directors, and that time she collaborated with an artistic monkey named Pockets Warhol. We also go into a dark moment when she was embroiled in a nightmarish copyright lawsuit. And because it's 2023, we'll talk about what artificial intelligence means for her profession. Anita, I'm so pleased to finally be here. Since we first spoke, I've watched, listened, talked to some of your colleagues. So. I was thinking we'd start from the beginning. When we first corresponded, we chuckled at the notion that we share kind of the same name. That's right. And you, then you said that your ancestors trace back to Transylvania. Can you talk a little bit about your background and your family? Well, sure. Yeah, so we are from a long line of people from Transylvania. In the 12th century, there were a group of German people who went and settled in Transylvania, which, you know, is Romania. And so I think what happened was that they, at that time, I mean, this is so long ago, but I think at that time, they needed to settle Romania. And I think a lot of Germans went and made their homes there. They were farmers and peasants. And I think they were given a pretty good deal. I think they were given land and they didn't have to pay taxes for five years. And, and I just recently have been doing a bit more research into it, and I find it really fascinating. We went there a few years ago, and it's beautiful and rugged, and the, you know, the mountains are just, it's just beautiful. People think it's very weird, and I remember my mother didn't really talk about it that much because she didn't like the way people talked about her people. She didn't like the whole ah. vampire thing, right? But anyway, if anybody is interested in Transylvania, King Charles has an Airbnb there. And you exactly. can go. It's one of these things that I discovered is that he is a very distant cousin to Vlad the Impaler. So 
There is that was the Transylvania connection, but that's the extent. That's of incredible. Yeah. yeah, it is so good. And your last name, I always have this hunch. I mean, I'm a reporter and I meet a lot of people, and sometimes someone's last name, or I would say often, gives a clue about their ilk. And your last name is Kunz, German for it, art. As if you're destined for I, this I, profession. I guess, so. <laughs> I guess so. It's very, very close. It's Kunst. But yeah, it's it's yes. very close. Was, was art a big part of your upbringing? I know you're influenced by your uncle. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, my first and one of my biggest influences ever was my was my uncle, Robert Kunz. And he was an illustrator. And this was way back, way back when. And his motto was art for education. And so kind of from that, I learned that it was great if art could serve some kind of a purpose or be useful in some way. And it didn't just need to be decorative. It could perform a function. And he was a huge inspiration. Not only was he an illustrator, and he illustrated all the textbooks when we were in high school. And he did the Children's Corner in our local paper in in Toronto. He was just amazing, but also he was just a quintessential artist. He did weavings and he made architectural friezes and landscapes and all that kind of stuff. But what I loved about him is that he also influenced me on my worldview, which is he had a studio on the lake. He was an environmentalist and he knew the names of all the animals. So I love that whole, that aspect of him too. So yeah, first big influence for sure. I'm going to make a sharp turn to magazines. Okay, because when you spoke, you said you've always loved magazines and this is what you wanted to do. Can you talk a little bit about why? I know you did some early work in advertising as well, but why made you fall in love with magazines? Well, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. When I went to art school, I went to the Ontario College of Art. And the only thing that I knew was that I wanted to draw pictures and I needed to make a living. It was as simple as that. So I, I went to college and I thought, well, I guess I'll be a children's book illustrator. And then I developed this kind of very cute style. And then I did some advertising. But I, I actually, I did quite a bit of advertising and I was able to, you know, I was lucky to make some money. But I got tired of drawing little animals and skirts and making cute stuff. And I wanted to grow and I wanted to do the things that were really interesting to me and things that were more political. I heard you describe your very first paintings as very, very dark. Is that true? This, okay, so I went through a phase where I did really cute stuff, but then what happened was I became very influenced by some of the British artists. And what happened at that time, and this really catapulted me into magazine work, was that two great art directors who came to Toronto, through Toronto to New York via the UK. And it was Robert Priest and Derek Unglis. And they went on to do great things in the magazine field. But what they did in Toronto was Weekend Magazine. And Weekend Magazine came out once a week. And it was kind of a general interest magazine. But they were using people like Sue Coe, for skiing, for a skiing article. They did a great cover of the anti-fur industry by Ralph Steadman. And I just began to really love the work of the British illustrators. And the work was darker. And I just, I really tried to stretch instead of doing, you know, work that was cute and palatable. I just really wanted to get into doing some more substantial work and to really be more of an artist and make work that was much more personal. So that's kind of where that's where that started. But also when I started, there seemed to have been so many possibilities. I mean, these art directors were doing really amazing creative work. It was really out of the box thinking. I think thinking, I knew I was going to talk to you about this. I've been trying to think of examples. I'm pretty sure it was Robert Priest who was doing something for a magazine. It was a fiction piece, and it was about three very different characters. So we got three different illustrators to illustrate one piece. This is really amazing thinking. So very, very early on, I was drawn a little bit to dark work, but also I just loved, to me, there seemed like endless possibilities in the magazine field. I hear some nostalgia for what was. 
Why do you think things changed abruptly now? Do you think it's the speed of production? What well, ha- We're talking a span of 40 years here. I don't know how they got away with it, except that they were allowed to do really creative work by the publishers, by the editors. So I think it, it all goes up to who's running the show. But I do remember back then doing all of this social and politically oriented work and having carte blanche, like having complete autonomy. That's the kind of thing that I think is really different now, that I would get a manuscript and I would be asked to give maybe one or two sketches. But I think back then there were a lot more art directors who were thinking in terms of not style necessarily just style, but that the illustrators, maybe we had a brain and that we had thoughts about these things and we had emotional reactions and we had intellectual reactions to the piece and that it didn't just have to be the way it looked. Do you remember your first magazine cover? The first cover. I'll tell you the first illustration I ever did. The first public illustration I ever did. I got out of school and you do everything that you're going to do and you spend hours putting together a portfolio and it has to be perfect. And you've asked all your teachers what you need to do. And so I went out there and I got a, I don't, it was for Toronto Calendar magazine or something. It was about the great Canadian bathtub race. And it was something so inconsequential. And I think it was maybe a three inch wide spot. And it was just really silly. It was just probably some little, I don't even remember, some little race to do with charity. And I got the job on Friday and I immediately went into anxiety attack, panic mode. I cried all weekend. I delivered the job. I'm like, it's so cute when I think about it now. I was just so desperate that this was going to be this incredible piece for the great Canadian bathtub race. I mean, it was just, it's kind of sweet when I think about it now. But I guess they liked it. I must have chilled out a little bit after that. But I thought, I can't do this. This is so stressful. I can't do this. I want to go back to that emotional roller coaster. But first, I've got to ask, what is the great Canadian bathtub race? I can't really remember. Well, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was just a silly thing. I assume it was done for charity. But I mean, that was my big splash into the field of illustration. I want to go back to what you said about art directors and freedom. And your work has been, as we all know, has been published in every major magazine over the four decades. Time, Newsweek, GQ, New York Times, New Yorker. Can you tell me what makes a good art director? I actually have an awful lot to say about that because without great art directors, illustration really can't thrive. The ones who are the most open-minded and interested are the ones that, you know, and in my view, offer the most creative freedom, I think are the best. And I am so endlessly lucky that I've gotten to work with these incredible people. I'll name some of them if you don't mind. In Toronto, one of the first great art directors I worked for was Louis Fischoff. And he was at Saturday Night Magazine. And this was after my cute phase. This is what I was doing serious illustration. But subjects that he gave me to illustrate, I mean, I remember there was one about Helmut Rauka, who was a Nazi war criminal found living in Toronto. And the assignment was to basically read it and come up with a couple ideas. And that was it. It's a far cry from what happens now, where it seems like almost every detail we're being told exactly what to draw. But I had such a visceral reaction to the story. I think that always helps come up with a better image. I'm just going to interject here and say, I moved to England for a while and I went to see the art directors there and I went to see Gary Day Ellison at Picador Books. I knew he was a great art director. And the first thing he asked me was, what do you read? I mean, that sounds like such a nothing question, but it was so that he could know what kind of jobs that I could do my best at. I worked for Steve Heller. I worked, I was in the right place at the right time. Tremendous luck. Arthur Hochstein, I got to do time covers and I did some Canadian time covers for Edel. But I didn't want to make a list for you because I knew that if I left some people out, I would feel terrible for a week (laughs) after. But just all this wonderful work that we illustrators used to get, you know, I used to get two or three jobs a week and I just wrote down some of the topics all over the place, but really interesting socially and politically oriented subject matter about things like marijuana legislation, chronic fatigue syndrome, Viagra. I did a time cover about Viagra. 
American politics, motherhoods. I did the sex column for GQ, censorship, the drug wars, gun control, child abuse, politics. This was pretty heavy stuff. And a lot of us illustrators, because we were given this great, tremendous freedom, I really think it was a little golden age in the the 80s and 90s. I didn't realize how great it was and how lucky I was to have that kind of freedom to to make pictures and have everybody see them. It was amazing. I love hearing those stories. But as we know, with great freedom, the burden goes to the illustrator to come up with a novel, original solution. Now, I spoke to one of your former art directors at Rolling Stone, Gail Anderson. I asked her, what would you ask Anita if you could ask her anything? Actually, her real answer is, can I buy one of her paintings? Oh, I'll send her one. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but her real question is, I'll read it. She says, how has she kept it going at such a high level for so many years? She says, I mean, I go back to 1994 with Anita, and that was a long time ago. Anita's managed to get better and better and has never rested on her multiple laurels. How do you keep it going? How do you keep it fresh? Well, that's that's incredibly sweet. I think Gail is one of the great art directors. I loved working for her. First of all, I could talk for an hour about Fred Woodward. Maybe we can talk about him. But just working for Gail, you know, she, she was, she is one of the greats. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people realized at the time that Fred was doing all these amazing spreads and designing all this great stuff, but so was Gail. I think a lot of people may have assumed that it was all Fred, but she has always done this like amazingly terrific stuff. I know I certainly was hoping that she would get the art direction job after Fred left, but you know, she's absolutely amazing. But I could ask her the same thing. How does she keep it going? But I think I just have a restlessness. There's all kinds of stuff I still need to do. I feel like I want to do. As I get older, I feel more of a sense of urgency, like, oh, I want to do this and, you know, I need to do a book about this. So there's all this stuff I still want to do. Also, I'm absolutely terrible at boredom. So dark things happen when I'm bored. I really need to keep, I need to keep busy. The pandemic was, you know, I don't know. I had to do something. So I painted 400 pictures of women to know, cool. but I got stuff done. I just am very restless as a person, and I just need to keep doing stuff. So that's the real answer. Mm. But thank you, Gail. I'm going to go back to the book and the 400 portraits in a second. Oh. But I want to ask you, so you are restless. You are thinking of ideas. What happens if you ever get stuck? I always ask this because as a writer, there are some things like walk around the block, drink a lot of water, I don't know, some weird tactics. But it's never worked for me. My only thing is to start. I wonder if you ever experienced the so-called block on a deadline. Yeah. Oh, what sure. Yeah. I don't think there are any artists or writers who don't. But I think sometimes, I remember in the past, I just got really tired of doing the same thing and using the same formula. And I just thought, that's it. And I got some clay and I started playing with clay and I just needed to pound out some of the frustration. Yeah. But I think I try something different. I think that's the answer. Just I try something different. But it, it happens a lot. And I think whatever you can do, I think everything that you said is right, go for a walk. But I've put together all these quotes for students. And I can't remember who it was. It may have been Chuck Close or maybe it was Milton. It was probably Milton Glaser who said, you just have to sit down and keep going and it'll come back. You know, it's not always about inspiration. It's about just sitting down and actually getting the work done and it will come back. And I found that there are always ups and downs, but it will come back. Or maybe it won't. I don't know. It hasn't. <laughs> I'm still doing it. I don't know. You're still doing it. Living yeah. proof yeah. that it works. Yeah. You've also talked a lot about handling rejection. Now, in those 10 tips you give to creatives you've written, I think a list that you constantly update, maybe. But yeah. one of them I was really struck by. You said, embrace self-doubt. It will propel you forward. Now, I have a follow-up question there. Self-doubt can sometimes be interpreted as lack of confidence, can be a negative. But how do you spin that? How do you propel that forward? And also, where does the artist's ego or voice come into this interplay? First of all, rejection is so commonplace in the arts. You really have to develop a thick skin. Um, yes. 
So I, I don't really quite know how I did it. But the whole thing about moving through the gut churn or whatever, that's Milton Glaser said that. So what I've written for students is really stuff that I never knew. I was wondering why when I was young, like, what's wrong with me? Why am I always dissatisfied? And, you know, what can I do? And what can I do to be better? And what's wrong with me? I always used to think that kind of stuff, but I never learned anything in school about that. What we learned in school was that here's how you do the job and here's what you do, but none of the surrounding things. So yeah, it's just moving through it. And I think the bottom line is just it's something that you feel that you need to do. And so whatever it takes, it just needs to be done. And I don't know where I developed that kind of tenacity. I think I was just always really stubborn and I still have a lot of rejection. It's really common. And I think it's important for students to know that it's not them. We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Mag Culture. Read our online journal, listen to our podcast, and visit our shop to discover why we're convinced print is very much alive. All available at magculture.com. Print is Dead is made possible by the support of the Society of Publication Designers. The SPD powers the future of visual storytelling, setting the standard for editorial excellence, and shaping the future of visual culture. For more information, visit spd.org. I wanted to probe more on the self-doubt thing. Yeah. I, I wonder how you feel whenever you submit an illustration. What are the feelings swirling around you? You talked about how you felt for the first illustration. You're wrecked with doubt and worry. <laughs> Has that simmered down? How do you feel? Thankfully, it simmered down. Otherwise, I would have had to do something else. But when I do commercial illustration, everyone is really different. Every job has its own set of parameters. Sometimes they're completely self-generated. But for the most part, when I hand them in, there's no great eureka. There's no great joy. I always think I could have done better. And when I see it in print, I think, ah, I should have done this or I should have done that. I listened to Barry Blitz podcast, which was great, yes. by the way. And I was actually interested to hear that he does things two and three times. So for somebody like him, I mean, part of what he does that's so brilliant is that the work looks so effortless. But anyway, I don't really know too many artists who aren't insecure or don't have tremendous self-doubt. I think that's kind of the nature of the beast. Mm. Can I ask you about what you describe as maybe the darkest point in your career, if that's okay. I, I read about a lawsuit you were embroiled uh, in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to bring that up with The New Yorker. I think it was a 1995 cover and yeah. someone claimed that yeah. he had the same idea. Yeah. But what really interested me was you saying that after that, you became a little paranoid. Well, I was paranoid to begin with, but <laughs> that didn't help. <laughs> well, there was an artist who... After my first New Yorker cover, it was 1995, and I was so thrilled. And first of all, Francoise is another person we could talk about for an hour. She's amazing. But yeah, so I did my first cover, and it was called Mohawk Manhattan. And it was around the July 4th weekend, and it was all about America, rah, rah, rah. But I wanted to sort of do something about, you know, Native Americans and that it, they were really the ones who were ripped off. So I wanted to make a nod to... Native Americans, you know, let's think about that on July 4th. So I did Mohawk Manhattan and it was an indigenous person with, with a Manhattan skyline. And so after I was thrilled, my first job, I was so happy. And Francoise called me and said, there's somebody here who said you stole his idea. And, and I said, oh, okay, who is it? And she gave me information and I called him. And probably I shouldn't, like now that would never happen. Now it would just yes. be like, let's get the lawyer. So anyway, he seemed to think that I stole this idea. I didn't know who he was. Nobody I knew knew who he was. And he presented me with a lawsuit. I took four years of Manhattan civil course. It was kind of a nightmare. And the whole point was that was a plagiarism lawsuit. He said, I stole yeah. his idea. But of course, the further we went along, the more ridiculous it sounded really ridiculous. And then ultimately, of course we won. But what ended up happening was now, if you become a copyright lawyer, it's a precedent setting case. Nobody has ever challenged the notion of copyright. So after all said and done, it's something that young copyright lawyers learn about. So it's a very famous case. But what you said is correct. I mean, when you're accused of something like that, you're thinking, you know, maybe I was walking in New York and someone walked by with a t-shirt on and I yeah. subconsciously registered it. And so every time I did a job and the idea came too quickly, I remember thinking, oh, I must have seen it. It really 
jeopardized my ability to come up with ideas. And of course, we know that ideas are not copyrightable. So it, it basically made that case. But yeah, that was a really low point for me. Are but I have still- to say, The New Yorker was 100% behind me because if you've worked in this business long enough, you know that the ideas are something that we all use freely. Yes. I used to work for Newsweek sometimes and Time Magazine, and sometimes they would come up with the same idea. That's why we use ideas to, you know, to talk about and concepts. And also with yeah. social media on Instagram or saturated with images. Yeah. Absolutely. You, have you gotten over this sort of like paranoia or like double checking if someone has ever done the same construct? Well, I, I think I understand that it happens. I remember my beloved, my great art teacher, Alan Cobra, one time we came up with the same idea. It was for a, something about pollution. It was an Earth Day and we both did like a pig with, you know, and it was just, we laughed about it because that's, it happens. But one of the things I do now deliberately is before I submit something, maybe to the New Yorker, I'll do a Google search. And if it's been done, I won't do it. So I sort of preempt it just in case, but that's fair enough. I don't want to do something if someone else has done it anyway. It's just mm. courtesy. I want to shift yeah. to your techniques and tools. I know you told me that you still paint in this sort of era of digital illustration. Yeah. You use acrylic Paint, and there's a particular thing we had talked about. I, I said that I love how you render eyes. And you said, oh, actually, people have commented on how I render hands. Oh, that's um, right. <laughs> can you talk about your hands, how you take care of them, and why this fascination with hands? I mean, it's just the way I draw, honestly. When I started, I just tried to get it together to do a drawing quickly because there were always deadlines, and how to make something as expressive as possible. And I thought the use of, of hands always made something a little bit more more expressive. I guess that's the only word I can think of. So that was something I think I probably overused early on. But when I started, the, the medium, I've always worked in traditional media. Right now it's acrylic. When I first started, it was watercolor. But when I was working for magazines, everything had to be done so quickly. So I couldn't make a giant painting and use oil paints, although some people do. I don't know how they do it. But for me, it was if I had a day to do something, I had to do it quickly and I had a certain amount of real estate to fill. And so for me, that meant working in water-based materials, which mm. I'm glad I did because it's, it's green. It's safe. That stuff is safe to use. There's no turpentine or benzene or anything like that. It's all green. And I still use traditional, I mean, I've sort of grudgingly learned Photoshop just because it's something I have to do. Of course, there's no sending via FedEx the final art anymore. I need to be professional and properly scan and color correct and all that stuff. But still, I like painting. And these days, I'm working less to specifics and I'm doing a lot of my own stuff. And so I'm just experimenting with working really big and trying different materials, trying acrylic. Painting big forces you to change the nature of the way that you work. So I don't work with little tiny watercolor brushes as much anymore like I used to. That's wonderful. You mentioned Milton Glaser a couple of times. Yeah. I was with him till, you know, the, his last years working in his studio and working on a book and his hands to the last day were perfect. Really? No shaking. Oh. I think one time, he experienced a little tremble and he said something about, is it Matisse leaning into how your hand shifts? And he did a portrait just sort of like deliberately with a shaky hand. But uh, he, yeah. he also said that the brain is directly connected to the hand. It's a weird statement that I've never stopped thinking about. Yeah. Uh, but whenever I see him, I look at his hands. Perfectly. That's amazing. I was so in awe of him. I think the few times that I met him, I probably didn't notice that much. But certainly, I think he was absolutely one of the greats. I want to talk about your fascination with portraiture. You've done many, many portraits, but I particularly love your self-portraits. Oh. <laughs> I found one, you as Frida Kahlo, you as Albert Durer, you as Mona Lisa. Can you talk a little bit about your approach to portraiture and why you chose some of these characters to embody you. Yeah. When I think back, 
I really did start doing mostly socially and politically oriented work and using metaphor and to, to illustrate these things. But I think when I started working with Fred Woodward, he's the one that gave me my first portrait assignments. And it was one of those things I didn't deliberately say, OK, I'm going to do portraits now. But I think the first thing I ever did for him was Ray Charles, and it was for the Dallas Times Herald or something. And from that point on, he just kept giving me conceptual portrait assignments. And I thought they were great. I mean, I loved doing them. I think I spent the majority of the years after doing almost predominantly portraits. But there was a lot of portrait work to be had, conceptual portraits. There was a lot of great stuff going on in the magazine world. I was working for Time, Newsweek, New York Times, Ms. Entertainment Weekly, Premier, And they all wanted portraits because that's what they were reporting on, what people, politicians, celebrities were doing. So I shot off into the direction of doing almost entirely portraits, which I actually love doing. I wasn't necessarily interested in, for Rolling Stone, doing some of the celebrities. I wasn't as interested in painting the celebrities as I was. Why are they celebrities? That that sort of was the backstory to that. But, But to your question... I I can't remember why I did those three. I did three portraits of myself as my heroes, basically. Mm. I think artists typically do self-portraits. Some artists do it more than others. And I always need portraits for things, (laughs) you know, authors, photos, but I want to give them some art instead. It was just an homage to three of my favorite artists. And I, I... put myself as them, and I called it Three Portraits with Facial Hair. It was just a silly thing, but it was kind of my faves. You mentioned heroes. If you could pick three of your, let's say, heroes in illustration. Oh, boy. Yeah, see, now I'm going to feel bad because the second I stop talking to you, I'm going to think of 10 others. But I would say that my favorites are always Ralph Steadman Sue Ko for just the incredible work that she does as an illustrator and also now as a fine artist. And I'm going to also at this point say Marshall Arisman because there's mm. no one who helped me more when I started. I was in Toronto for a while, moved to England for a while, and then came back to Canada wanting to work for the U.S. market because the U.S. market was huge. So I gathered up my courage and I went to see Marshall Arisman and he was so kind to me. And he gave me names of people to go see. And he really kind of jump-started my career. He was extraordinary. And of course, his work, you know, he was such a kind man just by himself, but the work was extraordinary. Here was somebody who was thought of as an illustrator, but absolutely straddled that fence into fine art beautifully. And his work was beautiful and moving and touching. So those are three, but there are tons more, lots more. What you said about Marshall Arisman is so true. I met him and that is... Perfectly accurate yeah. kindness and genius bundled yeah. in one. Absolutely. If you could commission any artist or illustrator, I don't know, in the in history to paint your portrait, <laughs> who might it be? Yeah, I really, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I've had my portrait done by a few people, but I think I've already had one done that I'm going to stick with. And it's a picture that Ralph Steadman did of me riding a camel. And that's Mm -hmm. hanging in my house. And if nobody else ever paints my portrait, I'll be happy about that. I'll be happy with that one. But my favorite illustrators are ones who are incredible thinkers, who are concerned for humanity, who who just go ahead and do what they feel like they're meant to do. And they're just incredible. But definitely at the top is Ralph. (laughs) What are Ralph over Leonardo da Vinci? Vermeer. Incredible. (laughs) Yeah, no, Vermeer would have been cool. (laughs) I didn't realize it could go back that far. I spoke to Mark Heffin at American Illustration, and he has only loving words to say about you. I asked him a few questions, but he basically just sent me sort of this really loving almost essay about how you've contributed to the illustration industry, not just about your work, but like how you've really been a voice for this industry. He gives three ingredients to describe your work, beauty, humor, and insight. Are those three things you try to balance? That's, that's incredibly kind. I'm not quite sure what to say. That's, that's incredibly kind. 
I love Mark. I love what he's doing. The American Illustration Annual, you know, right from the beginning, if you look at even the early annuals, you will see such a, an extraordinary array of illustration work. You know, everybody had a different style. Everybody was completely autonomous. It was really about their personal vision. It was much more like an art book than an illustration annual. And the fact that he keeps doing it, and at that time, that was really a testament to the kind of autonomy that we all had. But anyway, so grateful that he keeps this incredible book going. So he's, yeah, he's a dear friend. I love listening to your tirade against collaboration. I think I heard it in another. Oh. I love you said like you have you have to be given permission to realize your vision to be able to like I love this sort of like assertiveness about my individual vision. However, you've collaborated with a monkey. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering where this was going. Okay, I'm sounding like a real grouch, but I really don't like collaborating. Because when I collaborate with somebody, I keep thinking, what do they want? And how do I please them instead of keeping mm. it to what I think is best? But yes, I have collaborated with the monkey. Okay, I'm glad it's leading to this. So uh, for about five years, I haven't done anything recently because COVID changed all of that. I was volunteering at a monkey sanctuary, the only primate sanctuary in Canada that rescues pet monkeys and monkeys who have spent their lives in labs. They give them a good retirement. So it was for me, it was just really interesting because I love drawing monkeys anyway. And I just think they're so human-like and I think we're so monkey-like. And so just from that standpoint, it was really amazing to sort of just be around monkeys. But one thing that they do that I think is really kind of interesting is that there's a white-capped capuchin monkey that they named Pockets Warhol because he looked like Andy Warhol with his hair. And he really likes painting. So there's one person there who works with him and she puts out paint and he sits there and he makes these paintings. And it's really good for one of the things that with captive animals, you try to keep them busy and keep them happy and not just have them sit in cages and you try to keep them occupied. So that's one thing that he likes to do. He just, he loves painting and the sanctuary sells them and it really helps to keep it going. But what I did once is I thought, well, what, what would happen if I collaborated with him just for fun, just to see what would happen? And so I gave a painting and he started working on it. Actually, we did this a few times now that I think about it. But the first one ever was a picture I did of a woman and a monkey. And he looked at it and he painted over it. And he, I think he improved it. But then the very last thing he did was he put a slash over the woman's head. And I thought, whoa, that's a political comment right there, isn't it? But that, it was just one of those fun things that, you know, it was just, it was really fun and hopefully helpful for the sanctuary. I love that. And you've done a portrait of Ellen DeGeneres together. Yes, we did. Because <laughs> Ellen is such an animal lover. Yeah. Oh, so, but we did a portrait of Ricky Gervais too. <laughs> oh my goodness. Because Ricky Gervais is also, he's actually a supporter of the sanctuary. Yeah. You mentioned volunteering at sanctuaries. I was wondering... It sounds like you might be working all the time and very busy with illustration work seeped in this industry, in this profession. But do you have hobbies outside of illustration or art or your profession? What do you like to watch? What do you like to read? Any guilty pleasures we oh, should know about? Of course. <laughs> Lots of guilty <laughs> pleasures. I just finished watching Black Mirror, the new, oh my goodness. Anyway, if you haven't watched it yet, the first one is about AI. But as far as anything else, I am not a polymath. I'm terrible at everything else. The only thing I can do is illustrate seemingly. So thank goodness I was able to be so lucky as to have found so many great art directors to work with. But yeah, I, I'm not very good at other things. I'm a terrible cook. I really don't, you know, I'm not much good at anything else. But I have to say, going back to my uncle, I love being in nature. I love spending time in nature. I love kayaking and being out in the winter. So I'm a big nature lover and a big, you know, animal advocate. I do, you know, I do as much as I can, but I'm not working all the time, especially now. I spend tons of time working on a project and now I feel like I'm a little bit between projects, but there's always stuff to do. Like, you know, I need to organize now my last project and it's going to be a traveling show. So there's all kinds of stuff that needs to be done for that. So there's always, there's always stuff to do. I also heard that you might be an incredible snowboarder. Oh, <laughs> well, I was certainly one of the first, but I haven't done it recently. My bones are getting a bit creaky for that, but I used to love it. Yeah, I used to love it. We were the young punks on the hill, but that was many, many years ago. <laughs> 
We'll be right back. Print is Dead is made possible with the support of Issues Magazine Shop. Much like this podcast, we exist to celebrate the people and projects keeping print alive. We sell a mix of independent and commercial titles from around the world, shipping globally from our retail shop in Toronto, Canada. Visit us online at issuesmagshop.com. Stack the Independent Magazine Club delivers a different publication every month to our subscribers all around the world. You never know what we're going to send next, but you do know it will be a beautiful, intelligent, independent magazine that deserves a place on your shelf. We'd love to start sending something your way, so go to stackmagazines.com to sign up and start receiving a surprise magazine every month. I want to switch to your books, The 400 Portraits and The Book okay. Dimension. So from doing a lot of commissions and working for magazines, you've, I guess during the pandemic, began these two, and three actually, there's a third one coming. You began these projects for yourself. Can you talk a little about first about another history of art, which I'd love to leave. Well, thank you. Years ago, I think maybe 20 years ago, I started doing my own work. I wasn't getting the kind of freedom that I liked anymore in the publishing world. And I just started trying other things. I started trying to paint really big. I actually tried an excursion into the art world, which failed miserably. I mean, illustration does not translate well into the art world, I have found. There's some kind of a stigma. If you've been an illustrator, watch out. But I had these paintings, and I thought, even as I moved away from print, I always come back to print. And I think it's interesting that this whole podcast is about, is print dead? Because I always seem to come back to it. So... I, I made a whole bunch of paintings and the art world, somehow I didn't have the right pedigree or I don't know what that was about, but I thought, well, I think this might be a book. So the, another history of art became a book and it's satirical. I think my work is satirical, but it always has kind of a dark undertone. So it really, it's meant to be funny and it takes mm -hmm. a look at the history of art and how there are hardly any women in it and the history of art as we've learned here certainly is very European based and everything. And so I sort of redid a lot of iconic paintings as if I had done them. It's pretty cheeky. It's a pretty cheeky thing. So that became a book. And then what I started during the pandemic was this book of women you should know. And at this point, I've painted 400. And they're very simple. For me, it's more about the content. You know, it's why don't we know about these women, the woman who discovered what the nature of the universe and all these women who are extraordinary and that they should be household names. And so during the pandemic, I started to paint one a day. And but it was really, really inspiring. It was also inspiring painting one portrait a day of an extraordinary woman in a pandemic where we were asked to mask up and stay home, you know, big deal. What I was painting was women who endured the Holocaust and endured wars and did these extraordinary things. So it, it was a very interesting project to work on at a trying time for us. So I went back to print. I thought when I reached 100, I thought, I think this might be a book. <laughs> so I reached out to Chip Kidd, who I adore. And, and said, do you think this might be a book? And so it became a book and, you know, forward by Roxane Gay, which was like, couldn't get better than that. So that became my second book. But in the meantime, I kept going and I've done 400 portraits. It's going to be at the Rockwell Museum next summer, but hopefully it'll travel because it's just really, it's super interesting. And I made it really fun. You know, it's colorful and there are pirates and there's all kinds of stuff. It's for kids. It's for boys. It's for girls. It's been really fun and it's been really interesting. I use bright colors. Anyway, for me, it's just something, this is different than my other work because it's just purely information. You know, these are women you should know about. And then I have another book coming out in the fall and I'm actually working on another one. I really wanted to do something that's a thinly veiled book about parables having to do with the time that we live in and gender politics and the environment. And so that's what I'm working on now. So I seem to be, I'm straight back to print, no matter what, where, I don't never go too far, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm right back here. It's the right direction. You told me that you've started writing, and I guess this parable book could involve a lot of writing. How is that going? Are you okay uh, calling yourself I, a writer? I, well, I'm not a writer. The women's book was really just factual, you know, it's historical nonfiction. So it was a matter of just trying to 
write just enough about the woman to get people interested in their accomplishments. So I didn't have to write anything more than to explain the person's accomplishments and do it in a way that was concise. But yeah, I'm not a writer. And I also do everything backwards. The parable book will start from the paintings. The paintings are the jumping off point. And then I don't have to write that much (laughs) because I'm not actually comfortable writing. I've heard you give advice to your students that it's important to have some kind of fluency to explain your ideas, to have words to sort of explain your concept. Absolutely. Especially now, when I think back to when I was doing all the magazine work, I felt as though, especially with somebody, we've hardly talked about Fred Woodward, but he was so important in my career. But it seemed as though I worked with Fred and that was it. I'm not sure he ever went back to any editors. I think he just had the final say. I'm not sure how prevalent that is now, but it just seemed that I was working with Fred and that was it. And it's quite a bit different now. Anyway, I've read Publishers Weekly describes your books as trickster feminism. (laughs) Are you okay with the label feminist? Of course. I mean, the textbook definition of feminism is giving women and men the same rights and opportunities. Who doesn't want a fairer world, you know, it goes to everything, doesn't it? Differently gendered people or races or anything. Who wouldn't want a more fair world? So you mentioned you started 40 years ago. I imagine you might have experienced some sexism during the early years. Is that something that lingers and something you want to, I don't know, address now? When I came up, I went to a school called the Illustrator's Workshop, and it was always men. It was always just Mm -hmm. white men. And I think they they brought in Barbara Nessam for an afternoon, the great Barbara. She's a guru. She's wonderful. She's amazing. And that was really the only contact I had with a female illustrator. And even when I was teaching, I was always the only female. And I used to get asked all the time, why aren't there more women? I think I have more sophisticated answers now. But at the time, I I kind of just you know, stubbornly kept working. And I didn't really consider that there were fewer female illustrators. For me, there were always more female art directors. But now the older I get, the more I see, yeah, there were some pretty, pretty nasty things. You know what? I've made a giant painting and I've put all the terrible things that people have said to me into the painting. And it's a picture of a woman and they're, they're kind of like little gashes and little tattoos and everything. Probably I will never show them to anyone, but it is, it's kind of helped me think, wow, that wasn't cool. That wasn't cool. That wasn't cool. That wasn't cool. I think there's still an awful lot of work to do. I think it's certainly better. I mean, there's so many amazing young women artists and designers, and I mean, just extraordinary, extraordinary. And again, it's just having the opportunity. Just give us the opportunity and we'll do our best. But, you know, part of the reason for the book was to showcase, okay, you haven't heard of a woman scientist. How about this one? It's sort of a love letter to the women who have gone before me who have not been recognized or have fallen through the cracks or who were marginalized. So it all comes out in the work. I imagine the books are opening you up to new audiences, maybe younger audiences, It struck me how generous you are to keep, I guess, reintroducing yourself. You have all the accolades. You are in halls of fame. But every interview I listen with you, you are generously sort of recapping your career. I'm happy to talk about this stuff because we have a small field here. And I think it's important to help people who are coming up in the field. I remember very well the artists who we went to see or who were my teachers. I remember very well the ones who were generous and the ones who didn't tell us what kind of pencil they use. Come on, you remember this stuff. It's not such a big world. And and I think especially kindness is really important. The thing about different audiences, you know, I mentioned briefly that I tried in, to get into the art world for a while. And you know, that was me really trying to find a different audience, but it didn't work. It didn't work until recently. (laughs) And this kind of maybe goes to sometimes you want to do something and you just have to wait for the right opportunity. There is now a gallery, Philip Le Bon Gallery in Chelsea, among all the really important fine art galleries. And he shows narrative art and he shows print art and he shows comics and he shows cartoons. And so I actually finally did get into a Chelsea gallery. And Philippe Le Bon is, is French. He's from Paris. And if you've ever been to Paris, you'll see that every 
block has bookstores and they love comics and they love narrative art. So maybe print is not dead. It's in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> what a quote. It's, it's not here. dead. It's, it's in Paris. in Paris. Yeah, it's in France. <laughs> I love this quote, print is not dead, it's in Paris. I wanted to ask you about the future of magazines and maybe editorial illustration. Uh, Right now, we're saturated with, you know, talk about generative AI. And there was this, I think it was Cosmopolitan Magazine who made a splash saying, oh, we collaborated with OpenAI and generated the first cover. How do you feel about this? Is this a threat? Is it an opportunity? You know, somebody asked me to write an article about it, and I don't feel I have the facts yet, 100%, but I don't like it. (laughs) I don't like it because, you know, a lot of the internet has been scraped, and a lot of the material is copyrighted material. I don't like it. I don't know where it's going to end. Somebody told me that my work is being used by one of the big companies, Stable Diffusion, and somebody told me, no, it's not just the work, it's your name. Apparently, any artist who goes to some of these platforms where you can type in your name and do such and such a dog in the style of Anita Kuntz. Well, I, d- I don't like it because now I'm competing with myself for something that I would charge such and such for. Now it's being done with no input from me. To me, that's identity theft. In season six of Like Mirror, the first one, I loved it so much. It was actually about this. It was about identity theft. Because illustrating, it's not just about style. It's not just about the picture. It's not just about a cool visual pun. Illustrators are, hopefully, we know about the world. We're intelligent. There is intent. It's not just a cute picture that we're going to slap here. There are any other number of things that compel an artist forward, you know, choice, When I was an illustrator, I constructed a career that allowed me to work for the people I wanted to and not necessarily for the magazines I didn't want to. So that was part of the deal for me was that I was able to make visual opinions. And again, I had autonomy. I mean, that was part of it. It wasn't just someone taking an arm from here and a leg from here. The thing that bothers me more than just how I think it's going to affect artists and writers is how it's going to affect culture, an already divided culture. I don't know how we're going to get together and continue to have any kind of a stable democracy when there's the potential for making any politician say something and nobody will know if it's real or not. Being an illustrator, everybody knew it was a painting. They knew it was a visual opinion. But with AI, that's the part that really kind of scares me. Like when there's no such thing as truth that we can all agree on than what happens to democracy. So I think it's actually a much bigger problem than how it's affecting my field. I keep actually reading everything I can about it. It's really fascinating to me. Because when I started in the field, I remember when faxes came out, wow, that was amazing. You know, I was mailing things or FedExing things. And when computers came out of the internet, changed everything. And I think this is gonna change everything too, but I'm not quite sure how yet. So that's the question of the decade or the millennia or whatever. My last question, how would you like to be remembered? You know, I would like, I would hope that I've contributed more than I've taken away. And that's it. I hope that I've done more good than harm. And I think that's all I can expect. Everything else is gravy. For more on Anita Koons, visit her website at anitakoons.com or at Anita Koons on Instagram. Her books, Another History of Art and Original Sisters, Portraits of Tenacity and Courage are available wherever books are sold. If you'd like to connect more deeply with our guests, be sure to visit our website where we have complete transcripts of all our interviews, along with portfolios, archival photos, links, and other great information. Visit longliveprint.co slash interviews for more. In other news, we've got swag. Yep, you can get Print is Dead merch on our site at longliveprint.co slash shop. All purchases go directly to supporting the podcast. Check back often. We're adding new stuff all the time. And finally, make sure you subscribe to our newsletter by using the form on our homepage. It's the best way to stay up to date on all of the Print is Dead news and to receive advance notice on the latest episodes. Print is Dead. Long Live Print is a member of the Hub and Spoke Audio Collective, a nonprofit association of audio storytellers dedicated to promoting and sustaining high-quality independent podcasting. 
including The Lonely Palette, the podcast that returns art history to the masses, one object at a time. In the most recent episode of The Lonely Palette, host Tamar Avishai takes on an iconic pro-choice image by the artist and activist Barbara Kruger and explores how, for all its directness, it might not be as straightforward as it seems. Sometimes the best political art is the art that makes you think for yourself. For more, visit thelonelypalette.com or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Print is dead. Long live print is made possible by support of listeners like you. If you'd like to contribute to keeping the podcast going, there are two easy ways. One, become a sustaining patron by making a monthly donation. Or two, make a one-time donation in the amount that works best for you. Visit printisdead.co slash support for more information. Print is Dead, Long Live Print is a production of Modus Operandi Design. For more information, visit our website, printisdead.co. Or if you're an optimist, longliveprint.co. Follow us on social media at printisdeadpod. Please give us a like and a review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps. Thanks very much for listening.